So welcome everybody to our bi-weekly advocacy chat. We host these advocacy chats every second Monday through the end of the session. That's likely to be the end of May this year. That's just a wild guess, but um, so we have a few more of these ahead of us. My name's Karen Horn. I'm the Director of Public Policy and Advocacy. And with me today is Gwyn Zakov, who is the uh, Municipal Policy Advocate. And Lisa Goodell is running the technology end of things in the background. We're also going to be uh, monitoring the chat for questions. So as we go along, you might put your questions in the chat. Um, Raise your hand if you have a question and we will try to get to all of them uh, before the end of the, the session. Everyone is muted to start. So please unmute yourself or raise a hand to speak. Um, and uh, we'll try to get through the bills first, I think, and then maybe circle back for questions, which might be a little bit different than we've done the last few times, but there is a lot of information to go through this week. The other thing I wanted to say is that um, you're gonna be hearing a lot of repeats this week in terms of bills that we've um, talked about in the past. Last week was the second week of crossover. So all the money bills had to be out of their committee of last reference by Friday. And um, this week, what you're going to see is a lot of bills moving through the House and Senate calendar. So they'll be taking them up, referring them, um, passing them, and amending them this week. And there's going to be a lot of floor time, and we suspect not particularly um, a lot of time in committee. I'm going to talk about local option taxes, the education property tax, natural resources board, and the budget. So just starting off with the budget, late Friday evening, the House Appropriations Committee voted out the budget. There's actually not a lot of detail about the budget on the legislative website yet. I expect it won't be there until this evening and there's also no bill number yet. So what happens is once the House Appropriations Committee votes the bill out, then staff take the weekend, pretty much all of the weekend to go through, um, correct any errors, make sure that everything's in place and get the information to legislators before um, they have to vote on it. They need to have that bill at least 24 hours before um, it's brought up on the floor. So I think all of that is in process now. The budget uh, totaled $8 billion, B billion. Um, it distributes 420 million more in approximately 20, 420 million more in American Rescue Plan Act dollars. Uh, it does not um, fund a request from the Vermont League of Cities and Towns to expand the ARPA assistance and coordination program uh, through the end of the federal ARPA timeframe now, which would be December 31st of 2026. And it does not fund our request for an expansion of the services that we've been able to provide for you for ARPA um, to the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act funding. Our, our executive director, Ted Brady, was in Washington last week, actually in Washington, physically in Washington, and um, at a meeting of the National League of Cities. And what they're hearing from around the country is that towns um, really don't have the, uh, don't know what they need to do in order to access dollars from the Infrastructure Investment Jobs Act for programs um, and there's a lot of uh, concern that they won't actually be able to secure any of those funds that are going through new programs to address a whole host of issue, infrastructure issues from roads to climate change to, to um, 
all kinds of, of things, water, wastewater. Um, the, the other thing that is very apparent in Congress is that, and I don't mean to scare folks here, but um, that members of Congress are interested in clawing back some of those ARPA dollars, mostly from the state level where they haven't been spent yet. Um, but that uh, towns need to be cognizant of that as well. And, and we have urged caution. We've, we've asked you to be um, circumspect and put together your committees with community members to look at what your best funding um, priorities might be. That all remains true, but there is this um, in the background that, that we can't ignore. Uh, the, one of the other things that was not funded, um, surprisingly to me, in the uh, House Appropriations Budget Bill was money to help with the missing middle um, housing um, initiative. And so there's a lot of money, a, a huge amount of money going for affordable housing, for subsidized housing, for rehoming the homeless. Um, there's, they decided not to fund the um, programs that would help um, first time home buyers maybe purchase their first home or uh, help landlords with maybe one or two um, units attached to their house, upgrade those units and um, return them to the rental market. I think we'll hear a lot more about that as the housing bills move on the Senate side and get over to the, to the house. The, um, and so just moving to that for a second, S226 was the housing bill that was voted out of the Senate Economic Development Committee. That bill is on the calendar for tomorrow, the Senate calendar for tomorrow. It's been through the Finance Committee and the Appropriations Committee. And that bill would provide um, $15 million over the course of two years to help uh, people build um, and acquire uh, that missing middle housing or workforce housing um, that's in such short supply in Vermont right now. The other bill that, that sort of addressed housing and planning in Act 250 in the Senate, which is also on the calendar for tomorrow, is S-234. And that came out of the Senate Natural Resources Committee. Uh, it would make changes, uh, along, as does S226, make changes that um, exempt um, development in designated centers from Act 250. The S234 also adds in a number of um, provisions, including uh, new protection for habitat and for forest blocks. It reinstates an 800 foot rule road rule that was in place several de decades ago. The idea being that you should not build long um, narrow roads up into forest habitat or protected areas. Um, it would also, and I find this almost amusing today given um, the fact that if you live or are responsible for dirt roads right now, you know that there's no much, they're not dirt really, they're more mud or soup or something. But the um, S234 would allow um, wood products industries to operate outside of operating hours from October 1st through April 30th. Um, I think there'll be more uh, coming on that front that would be as part of an Act 250 permit that a wood products industry logger um, or whoever would, would get for um, operating their business. So that's kind of a jumble, but that's the budget and the housing bill in the Senate and the um, Act 250 bill in the Senate. I'll also mention that S210 is the bill um, that passed the Senate that includes the um, 
rental housing registry, a sort of much reduced rental housing registry, and would move jurisdiction for rental housing inspections from the local health officer to the Department of Public Safety. Um, and that bill also includes, S210 also includes money for um, housing, for the housing programs that have been proposed by the administration as sort of an incentive to sign S210 when it gets through the process. So those housing program dollars are not in the appropriations bill, they're in um, S210. Uh, I did want to talk a little bit about um, local option taxes. And so Gwyn is going to talk to you about S181, which is the municipal authority bill. Um, but one component of that was language that would allow any town in the state to adopt a local option tax without having to get that approved by the legislature. So you wouldn't need to um, adopt a charter or amend your charter uh, and take that to the legislature for approval prior to um, the voters actually adopting and approving a local option tax. It's something that's been passed by the Senate um, many times before. Uh, early last week, it looked like maybe the Senate Finance Committee was not interested in supporting that um, measure this time around. But after discussions with us on Friday, um, they did support general authority to adopt local option taxes on a vote of 7-0. So we're very pleased with that outcome. And one of the two of the arguments that we um, used when we were talking to them is that actually there's already 76 towns, I believe, who as a result of the passage of Act 60 way back in the day that um, uh, um, revamped the education funding system in conformance with the, the Supreme Court Brigham decision. Uh, there are 76 towns that can adopt local option taxes without going through the legislative process, approval process today. And secondly, we have 60 some towns that have opted in to retail cannabis sales. And the only way that those communities are going to be able to derive any revenue from that new uh, retail business in their community is if they adopt a general local option 1% sales tax. So that was actually news to some of the um, senators in the Senate Finance Committee. Uh, nevertheless, um, we, we were pleased that that legislation got passed. The, um, the other bill that I wanted to talk to you about is the education property tax um, yield bill, H737. And it sets the yield um, for the uh, coming fiscal year. It also um, states what the average um, homestead property tax is for the coming year and the non-residential property tax is established in that bill. The, uh, the, the homestead property tax rates and the non-resident property tax rates are going down. That's um, partly because of federal dollars that are still in the system. It's partly because of um, significant surpluses in sales tax revenue, meals and rooms revenue, and um, uh, increases in grand list value. So um, that's all to the good. The bill would also include as an obligation of the education fund providing universal free breakfast and lunch to um, students in the K-12 system. We agree that that's a, 
a worthy goal, that that's an important consideration for the education committee to decide if that's something they, they think is necessary. Um, but putting that obligation essentially on the property tax is using an inappropriate revenue source. And um, if you recall the way the property, the education property tax is structured and the fund is structured, um, two thirds of the education fund is property taxes from the education property tax. And one third of the education fund is made up of all those other sources, meals and room tax, sales tax, and, and uh, um, other revenue sources. When there are shortfalls in the other revenue sources, which is not the case this year, but is likely to be the case at some um, year in the not so distant future, the property tax makes up the difference. It's the fallback revenue source. And that, that's just the way the program is set up right now. So if there are shortfalls and if this obligation for um, funding meals is part of the education fund, then um, it would be the education, it would be the education property tax in years down the road that would that would pay for that. So um, that provision is still in the bill as it was voted out of the House Ways and Means Committee. They did hear our concerns around that and um, they said they shared them, uh, but I don't know how they're going to um, account for that in the, in the end. The other thing to know about the yield bill H737 is that every year it passes the house before all the information about school district budgets is available to the agency of education. And so they don't have final numbers on what the increase in school district budgets are or what the per pupil um, cost is or um, what the total amount of money that's gonna be needed by the education fund is at the point when that bill passes the house. And so it's going to continue being refined in the Senate and it may be when more of that information is available. And it may be that they make some adjustments over in the Senate to address this um, new obligation in the education fund. Uh, let's see. I did want to um, take just a moment to um, mention H-492. We haven't followed that bill particularly closely, but it's come out of the House Natural Resources Committee and is on the House floor this week. That is a bill that would revise the um, Act 50 board. So right now you have a Natural Resources Board um, the chair is full-time. The other members are um, per diem from um, around the state. And uh, they, that board um, does not hear appeals from Act 250 decisions made at the district commission level. That used to be the case. H-492 would return to that circumstance so that you would have a, they would actually establish a five member professional board, um, full-time members, and that board would hear appeals of Act 250 decisions at the, um, made at the district commission level. Those decisions right now are heard by the environmental court. It's been a very cumbersome, um, lengthy process with long wait times. Um, and, uh, and according to uh, some people, very inconsistent decisions from one district to another. So the idea is that not only you would move the appeals back to the environmental board where they are more focused on the uh, Act 50 law, but that you would get more consistency in decisions from one district co commission to another. So that's that bill. And I think at this point, I will turn it over to Gwen and she will fill you in on a lot of other bills that are moving. 
Here, we do have one question in the, in the chat. So let's just get to that first before I, I go. It's um, from Steve in Barry City. What guidance, if any, does VLCT or the state have for the IIJA, the Infrastructure Jobs Act? Well, um, there is not a lot yet. And that's part of the, that's part of the problem. So um, we, we are hoping to get more information on the funding streams and how they're going to be dispersed. Some of the um, IIJA monies are going through existing programs, transportation programs that when we'll talk about in a minute, um, water, wastewater, stormwater. But there are a lot of new programs where the details have not been finalized um, at the federal level. And there are also a number of programs where municipalities are going to um, apply to the federal government directly. And that's where we think towns are really gonna need some help um, navigating those requirements. Thank you, Karen. All right, so I'll get started um, on mine and then we'll answer questions at the end from everyone based off of what um, Karen and I both have talked about. Because Aaron, or because Aaron, because Karen <laughs> talked about the H1 um, S181 bill, which is the one that uh, led to her discussion on the local option tax issue. Um, this is a bill that is um, that uh, was referred to finance after GovOps is now on the floor of the Senate this week. Um, we're super excited about it. Um, anyone who has access to our online um, ledge reports, uh, I'd refer you to a couple of weeks ago, I think it was in um, maybe week number nine that I sort of did a, a rundown of the major provisions of the bill, but it's definitely a bill worth reading. Um, there's a lot of fun little bits and pieces uh, to it that um, would be really helpful to local governments. Um, uh, the way we approached this bill was uh, by going through a lot of charters that have been passed through the legislature over the last 20 or 30 years and um, pulled out a bunch of uh, provisions therein that we and others have felt would be really helpful to be broadly applicable to all local governments that they might want to adopt without having to go through the charter process. So in that list of, um, of, uh, of powers, uh, there are a lot of things that are found in other charters that just haven't been put into general law that um, towns might appreciate. A lot of them, uh, a lot of the things, and there are also things that um, you folks as members have reached out to VLCT and said, hey, wouldn't it be great if we could do X, Y, Z? So there's a few of those that are included in the bill. <clears throat> And um, uh, there's also some, in, some stuff in there that was just, uh, we saw as clarification language of underlying general law that would make your lives a little bit easier in terms of, um, of being um, in compliance with general law authority and not having to operate in sort of a gray uh, language area. So within that bill, obviously, there's this a provision that allows all towns and cities to adopt a local option tax without having to go through the charter process and getting legislative um, approval. Um, you know, Karen mentioned that they're, you know, the kind of the we, we, we like to refer to as the horses out of the out of the barn. <laughs> um, there are those towns that were the X, X60 towns. But since then, there are a tons of tons of towns and cities that have adopted local option taxes. Um, that uh, are not those Act 60 towns. So um, our position is that, you know, in terms of equity and, and allowing everyone to have equal access, it should be available to everyone and not have to go through individual approval through the legislature. Uh, there, are, so a uh, quick run through the, uh, there's some fun provisions in the bill about, um, you know, being able to lower your speed limits below that 25 uh, mile per hour uh, floor that's always been in statute. Um, you'd still need to go through your traffic studies, but um, if the science and the engineering were to justify something below 25 miles per hour, you could go as low as 15 miles per hour. Um, there is language in there to strengthen uh, um, your ordinance powers authority uh, dealing with uh, blighted properties allowing for uh, property maintenance standards within your, um, within your uh, ordinances. 
being able to adjust your number of um, AMPs, appropriate, appropriate municipal panels, how many folks you have on your um, uh, DRBs and your ZBAs, uh, allowing for your voters to allow for recall of local officials if they meet a certain petition um, level, uh, signature level. There is uh, uh, allowing towns to hinge their permits, their zoning permit approvals on getting all other municipal permits um, secured. Um, currently, that's not very clear in um, Title 117. Uh, that's clear, obviously, from the state's perspective for wastewater permits, but um, we wanted to get some language in there to say, you know, your final approval for a permit, you have to be able to get all the other applicable permits that might be in your community. And there's a lot of other things in between. So um, again, go back to our, um, you can look up the bill online, they'll have a final as passed by the Senate version by the end of the week. Um, they don't have one right now as a cleaned up version, but um, I'll, I can put into the chat a link to the more recent uh, voted out, out of the Senate of Ops version, but it's not the official one. So that's an exciting bill. We're really looking forward to, um, uh, hopefully, I mean, we're pretty pretty certain it's gonna get passed out of the Senate. And once it gets to the House, we're gonna need a lot of support from you as members. And um, if you read any provision of that bill and you really get excited about it, or you feel very strongly about it, I'd really be interested in hearing from you because we would like to have as much support in the House and get possible people to either testify or talk to their representatives um, in uh, House GovOps or Ways and Means to um, really get this bill across the finish line because we put a lot of hard work into it and there's a lot of good stuff into it. And um, we're gonna need a lot more convincing on the House side of things than we did in the Senate. We generally get a lot of support from the Senate and it's a, it's a bit of a tougher climb um, in, in the House. Um, so another bill that we are paying attention to, which is now on the House, um, House floor for consideration is uh, H-512. This is a land records and notary bill. <clears throat> um, without sounding too uh, nerdy on, on the subject, um, it is essentially a bill that would adopt some uniform standards and put them into our general statutes. Uh, there is uh, something called the Uniform Real Property Electronics Recording Act lovingly referred to as your PURA, and then another one called the Revised Uniform Law of Notarial Acts, RELONA, we also refer to that to. Um, those two provisions are, you know, uniform standards that essentially deal with electronic documents um, and notarial acts that are done sort of electronically. And, um, you know, moving into the digital, um, the digital age and moving away from the, the paper age. And it would be um, the standards that are put in place. It would be uh, not a mandate upon town clerks or notaries to have to adopt these standards, but certainly um, the ability to have the authority to deal with these, you know, e-signatures and e-notary sort of documents and e-documents um, that currently don't exist under uh, general statute right now. Um, so uh, that was a proposal by uh, the Secretary of State's Bisara, the um, the land records folks or the records folks over there. And another provision of the bill that just as of note would be um, a report that's put in there. It's a report that um, would have to come back to the legislature next year where uh, uh, the Secretary of State's uh, office, Bisara, the Vermont League of Cities and Towns and v BMCTA, the Municipal Clerks and Treasurers Association would have to get together. Um, and we come up a with a report to, I'm reading directly, um, dealing with the fiscal governance and operational sustainability of uniform approaches to the modernization of the acceptance recording and availability of deeds and property records in electronic form. Essentially what that means is they want us to go, <laughs> go back and look at what we exactly need in terms of money, resources, um, you know, standardization support to basically get us into um, the century we're, we're living in and we'll be living in <laughs> moving into the future. Um, right now there's no money to do a lot of this. It's all self-funded through local governments and um, you know, it's very piecemeal. Um, through no, you know, 
no bad acts by the local governments, um, but it's uh, it would be the first time to sort of you know figure out where um, the the get a an inventory of how much it's going to cost for communities to um, head down this road. Um, another provision of the bill would actually add a new position to uh, the Secretary of State's office, which is great. It's a new position to help with the implementation of H five twelve, which is. Uh, really, really needed, and um, it will be an individual that that will be available to notaries and uh, town clerks and those that have to deal with land records and deeds and those sorts of things um, to help maneuver um, through those laws. The uh, next bill I wanted to talk about was the T bill. This is the transportation bill that. Um, we're really excited about and in a lot of ways, underwhelmed in other ways. Um, but I wrote about it in on Friday, I believe, in our ledge reports, you can read that there as well. But uh, suffice it to say that I, I was listening to the report from the House Transportation Chair and Vice Chair to the House Appropriations Committee when they were um, getting their um, money um, provisions before that committee. And it was sobering, and it was sort of a, a, a theme that has gone on since the beginning of January when they began consideration of the T-bill, but um, the chair very clearly said that um, the transportation fund and the transportation um, situation, even when you take into account the monies that are coming in from the federal government, um, is, is, an, is an okay shape this year, meaning that they're able to fund what they need to fund. But the financial outlook looking into as soon as next year and beyond is not, not great. Um, and that they are looking at a funding shortfall for next fiscal year, fiscal year 24, um, to basically do base transportation funding. I mean, we're talking about just covering your bases, nothing more, no, nothing extra. They're looking at... Um, um, a, a gap between anywhere between 40 and $80 million that they just don't have in their budget right now. And this is very concerning and something that um, everyone is concerned about and they're just not quite sure how to, um, to address it necessarily. And, and a lot of that has to do with just, you know, the cost of doing business and the fact that there is um, a decline in gas tax. Uh, and it also now there's extra pressure on it to meet the um, federal matches that are that are going to be required with this new federal funding. So it's going to become um, much more difficult to um, fund our entire transportation program, not just our, our municipal programs, but all our transportation programs uh, across the board moving forward. So that's sort of the somber news. <laughs> um, within the current bill, the T bill, is, the, the number of the bill is H736. Um, and there is a strong theme within the bill to include a lot of measures dealing with carbon reduction. Um, you know, this, this, this world that we're living in where we're, we realize that our transportation um, networks are creating the biggest uh, problems for um, carbon emissions. So there's a lot in that bill that deals to address those issues. And that this has started, and a lot of the, pro the funding that is in that bill is just a continuation of current programs um, that are um, that are in existence, and then a few um, instances of new of new um, programs uh, out there. So they have about twenty million dollars for electric of electric vehicle supply equipment grants. So those are charging stations. Uh, invest they're investing over just over twenty million dollars into new electric vehicle incentive programs for um, buying um electric vehicles um more money for the incentive pro or for mileage smart for re the replace your ride program for purchases of new e-bikes e-snowmobiles and e-atvs um there is funding for uh micro transit projects uh micro transit projects these are for like rural transit initiatives um, another $1.4 million was put into zero fare public transit to fund throughout the rest of this year um, because money had dried up in that. They want to continue it on. Um, there's a new pilot program for um, bike, uh, building up bike and pedestrian infrastructure and directing the agency with uh, in coordination of regional planning commissions to 
um, uh, get the news out to local governments about what monies might be available and what initiatives might be available to deal um, to address some bike ped um, projects that they might have um, in their communities. There's language in there dealing with um, some cleanup language about right-of-way accesses and um, that at the state level, this is not dealing with right-of-ways um, access permits at the municipal level, but um, just some cleanup language there that I, I, I don't need to get into detail now, but it's essentially what that language is. It's, it's cleanup language from um, statute. There is language in there that was added late into the bill about bridges, uh, covered bridges specifically. Um, this was put in by the vice chair of the committee, uh, Representative Butch Shaw, who uh, represents a district where there are a lot of covered bridges who get damaged quite frequently. <laughs> and um, they're putting their foot down. <laughs> they're getting mad that the statute has not been updated in quite some time. Um, and the penalties for um, injuring uh, for tickets um, that you can issue and penalties issued for damage to um, Covered bridges is was very very low. Um, and currently in statute right now, um, if there's damage to a bridge, the first the first instance of someone damaging a bridge, the, the they're fined a mere two hundred dollars. Um, and if there's a second violation by that operator, it jumps up to a whopping three hundred dollars. The proposal on the table would be to increase that violation uh, first violation to fifteen hundred dollars for a first violation, um, or a first violation could be as high as $2,000 if they, um, if what they did substantially impedes the flow of traffic. So if they stop traffic because they're stuck, um, that drops to 2,000. And then um, the fines are then doubled if there's a second offense. Um, so that is, uh, that's good. There's also a very small section in the bill, at the very end, I think it's section 50, 50 or 51, that deals with, um, uh, it's, I believe it's just a sentence or two that deals with um, Title 24 and allowing municipalities to um, recover the cost that uh, goes into providing rescue services to aid stranded operators or to move disabled vehicles um, from the roadway. So this would allow your public safety services that are engaged like fire departments and whatnot to recover the cost of providing those services. Now, in terms of funding, uh, the local funding measures in the bill are um, really good for bridges. So the bridge program was funded almost double what it had been last year. This is 100% thanks to the federal government funding um, the IIJA to allow for 15% um, of all of that bridge money uh, mandated to go to um, basically local projects, off network, basically off the state um, fed network projects. So you're gonna see a lot of um, bridges that are in the white book, the binder that are kind of in the queue, um, get funded um, the next fiscal year and they will be funded at 100%. That was another mandate in that Fed bill was that they had to be paid, uh, they had to be funded at 100%. So that's gonna um, expedite a lot of the uh, bridges, bridge projects that have been you know, waiting in the queue patiently. Um, so that's exciting. The rest of it in terms of funding is a little bit of a ho-hum at the local level. All of the local um, grant programs and our town aid, our general town aid, were um, funded at statutory mandated levels. There was no bumps in funding. They were recalibrated to basically just what the statute says they have to be funded at. Um, so what that really means is that uh, you're going to see uh, a tiny bump in um, local aid, general local aid, but really not have a bump because um, they had double funded, I shouldn't say double funded, they had readjusted um, the payments to towns uh, because of COVID. They had had that suspension for that six month period and then uh, put it back in 2021. And now um, the, what you're seeing this year um, or what you will be seeing in the, this, assuming, assuming this goes to the Senate and it's adopted as is, what you will be seeing is sort of a, uh, a readjustment to sort of normal levels. Um, 
so that's the um so that's the news on the t bill front uh the bill is uh uh moving through the house and um then it's on to the senate again so um that's exciting. The last thing I wanted to talk about was uh, regional dispatch. So there is a, um, so this is also a part of the uh, the budget bill that Karen had mentioned. Um, there's been a lot of discussion about uh, this regional dispatching plan that's been proposed from the Department of Public Safety and the commissioner. A lot of buzz in the state house and a lot of conversations um, between a whole, a whole host of stakeholders um, at the public safety level um, and now more increasingly at the local level um, outside of just the public safety folks. But essentially the proposal would be to um, fund a um, program of sorts to allow DPS to sort of fade away from the um, from their role as a dispatcher for non-state public safety agencies. And uh, instead, the money that uh, they would get would be used to fund the creation of supporting a regional center um, sort of marketplace, I guess you could say. Uh, essentially, there would be money for existing, those in the process of developing, and those that are on the uh, future uh, dispatch centers that would ge be geographically dispersed across the state that would be the centers that would provide dispatch for um, every public safety agency in the state if those um, individual towns or agencies didn't do it on their own. The uh, measure is to have about $11 million, upwards of $14 million uh, to go to this program. Uh, the final recommendation coming out of the uh, House Government Operations Committee, uh, they looked at it on Friday, um, was to essentially uh, create a, uh, a working group um, that would look at how the proposal would be funded um, past that initial influx of money at the state level. And uh, it would consider, you know, what it would cost at the local level, um, what the dispatch model would look like, and how the transition uh, would impact, uh, uh, would impact those communities and sort of have a, uh, uh, a means for communities to communicate to each other about, you know, how they pay for things, you know, especially for the towns that are um, either uh, paying for dispatch out of their property tax or their, you know, general funds, whatever, at the local level, um, be able to explain to those that, that don't, you know, how they are um, paying for things and um, what, to be expect, what, what is to be expected down the line if they um, move to a regional dispatch model. Um, we testified on this a bunch. Um, you know, there's good stuff and bad stuff about all of this. We definitely support a regional um, a model framework, but you know, the devil's always in the details, and there has not been any um, proposal to have any long-term funding in this. And um, I think there's a recognition that this, whether it's 11 or 14 million dollars, is, is it's a, a woefully inadequate amount of money um, to get to that um, those nine centers up and running um, fully. And so. Um, we uh, anticipate that funding to be in the in the budget bill, as I understand it is in the bill, meaning that um, it will head to the Senate with this proposal in it. Um, and we're going to hopefully have a conversation in the Senate as well, um, support this measure, um, but also hopefully allow um, this $11 million or a portion of that $11 million um, to go out the door early for those regional centers that are ready to go and reserve some of that money um, for those that aren't quite ready, but um, need a little bit more time to become, um, uh, yeah, roadworthy, I guess you could say. Yeah, because right now the, they are, they're going to get the appropriation, but not get the funding until um, January of next year um, once they report back to the legislature. So um, a happy medium would be for them to, you know, yes, allow the study of it and come up with these proposals, but also not impinge those that are ready to um, stand up their operations um, that are just waiting in the wings right now for that, for that money. So that's the um, update on that. I don't, 
believe I have anything else to add, Karen, for my for my list of things. So we can maybe go to questions. So are there any questions? Um, Gwen and Lisa will see if there are any questions. Or if you have other bills that we didn't mention that- I see there's a, there's a question from uh, Art. Does VLCC support H-512? We do support the bill. We've been working with the Secretary of State's office on that bill with the clerks as well. Um, it's much better than the as introduced version and it gets us closer to where um, the state needs to be in terms of implementing standards that are um, uh, not universally, but you know, nationally recognized as, the, as the, a stepping stone you need in order to get to online and electronic um, you know, day-to-day -day work. Um, we just don't have that language right now in our underlying statute. And that's been a big problem for um, getting uh, either not notar notarial acts or records management at the local level um, move into the 21st century. So we support that. Okay, so it looks you. like there was a question about H518 also, which is the um, bill that would implement the energy uh, municipal fuel switching um, grant program. And I believe that did pass the house on Friday. I could be wrong about that, but I believe it did. Uh, I, actually, Karen, <clears throat> that was going to be my uh, my comment. Uh, I would wondered if you had, had talked about it. Um, we haven't talked about it uh, yet today. Um, Am I correct that it passed the House? Uh, yes, I believe. Yes. Oh, let I, me look for just half a second here. I have a little my handy dandy list here. Uh, yes, it passed third reading. It passed uh, Friday. Um, yeah. And, you know, I supported it uh, as a, one of the legislators. Um, you know, I, I the question it, that occurred to me is, and I think the biggest question asked was how much of the stuff they propose do you have to do? In other words, they're, they're going to come in if it, and my example was, you know, what the towns I represent all have older town halls. If you wanted to upgrade your heating system in that town hall, uh, and that's all you really wanted to do, they're going to come in and give you you know, a whole song and dance about many, many energy options from from A to Z. Um, and I, my question was, can can the town say, yeah, that's good, but we want to replace the heating system in our town hall? And, and I, I, they said, yes, you can take a part of it and do that part. And that was my question to them. Yeah. So, so uh, right, right, and the the way we're understanding the bill is that you, the municipality would get an assessment done of everything that needed to be um, addressed in the building. And then part of that assessment would be prioritizing those projects. And you, you would um, actually uh, undertake the projects based on the priority, but so you might not get to everything. And, and in fact, you, likely wouldn't. Um, the, the one thing that we're still concerned about is the funding source, which is the capital projects fund. And that's why you need to um, have high speed internet in place by 2024. And you need to have um, space for the public to conduct work, education or telehealth in your in that building for a period of five years. Some buildings would be able to accommodate that. Um, some of the libraries might be very well suited for that, but some of the older um, municipal office buildings, uh, that would be a very heavy lift to try and figure a space yeah. for that. Yeah, right, and that, that, was, that was my concern with the bill. I, I, I voted for it and I frankly don't do that that often because I, I, I worry about these other ancillary things. I mean, when I think of the town hall in Clarendon where I live, you know, we're not gonna have healthcare in the bill in the building. We're, we're, we've got 
a couple rooms and a place for people to meet and it's used for people to vote and it obviously has our land records and, and all the folks that work there. Beyond that, I mean, I, I hope they don't tie a lot of things <clears throat> to what they what they want. I mean, I, I think a lot of places will want a specific um, thing done around heating, a, a specific, you know, we, we want the heating system upgraded so we're not paying a lot in oil, and, and that's laudable and, and, and good. Uh, if we have to do a lot of other things that tie into, yes, you can have the money, but we want you to X, Y, and Z, then that makes it less good, so. Yeah, yeah, we, we, we did have similar concerns about that. One of the other um, requirements is that the building be ADA compliant upon completion of the project. And that actually is a pre-existing requirement. Excuse me, I have a dog whining. <laughs> that is a pre-existing requirement um, of the federal law that build it, public buildings be ADA compliant. Here we have a handout from Peter Berger. Yeah, it, it was, uh, this is about the public safety and dispatch. Um, our town fairly was excluded in the beginning uh, as a choice. Is this going to be a statewide initiative or is this going to be? Uh, you mean the dispatch model, the whole model? Correct. Because there, there are some towns that are on state dispatch and there are other towns like ours that, that aren't. Right. So the proposal is if you are one of those communities that is, there's a pro, or I shouldn't say communities or agencies, it's not just communities. Um, but uh, if you're one of the 105 or so agencies that is either full-time or part-time dispatched by the state police, the idea would be that the state would no longer be dispatching for those agencies. And the funding would put into place a regional framework where existing dispatch um, entities and future to be to yet to be stood up regional right. entities would fill in um, fill in for that role. Right, because that's uh, I mean we I've tried to get on the list to get on state dispatch, but have been denied. The so, state so, has, I don't remember for exactly how long, but the state for at least four or five years has correct had a, you know, do not add correct. Um, policy. So there they are, you're right. There's no new entities being added to that list. I did just want to circle back around to Anne's um, question about the ADA. Um, I, I think it would be difficult for um, for the program to say you don't need to be ADA compliant because it's using federal dollars and that's a federal requirement. We did hear from, I believe it was the town of Castleton about what the cost would be to make their building or at least a portion of their building ADA compliant if they had to install an elevator. And it's a, it's a significant, um, cost, which is why, of course, so many buildings haven't been able to achieve it yet. Right. Uh, are there other questions? Any other questions from folks? No. Well, um, if not, I would say thank you once again for joining us. Um, talk to your legislators about the, the details of all these bills. If you um, have any uh, thoughts about um, using any of the mechanisms that would be provided in S-181 under new municipal authority, make sure that you talk to your house members about that because it's been, um, Fairly smooth sailing, I would say, with that legislation in the Senate. But as Gwen said, our um, difficulties are going to be in the House, in the Government Operations and Ways and Means Committees. 
Yeah. We generally in the Senate can, and, you know, a VLCT can testify and, and we kind of, you know, speak for the trees where the Lorax for you folks, but, and that, that tends to work okay in the Senate, but in the house, they really love hearing from their local officials. So really talk to your, your local reps. And if you really feel like you are, feel excited about this bill, please reach out to me. And I'd love to talk to you one-on-one -on -one and maybe get you um, either written testimony or um, in the queue to testify and just to have a face to um, um, support the bill. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Have everyone. Stay dry on those mud roads. <laughs>